Hello. In this video, I'll be discussing some specialized maneuvers within the abdominal exam, which you would not need to perform on most patients, but which are useful in specific situations. Specifically, I'll be discussing ascites, peritonitis, and other intra-abdominal infections, assessment of the liver, abdominal bruise, and something called the abdominal wall tenderness test. Assisting today as our patient is Olga. The first condition I'll discuss is ascites, which is the general name for free fluid within the peritoneal space. Ascites has many etiologies, of which the most common is cirrhosis. Other notable etiologies include heart failure, nephrotic syndrome, malnutrition, intra-abdominal malignancy, and in some parts of the world more than others, tuberculosis. The primary indications to use these maneuvers for identifying ascites is abdominal distension of uncertain etiology, or in patients with known or suspected cirrhosis. If you happen to have a patient in whom you already know ascites is present, for example, from recent imaging, there would be no need to perform these maneuvers unless you just wanted the practice. Now, there are three commonly used evidence-based methods for identifying ascites on exam. The most basic is referred to as bulging flanks, seen on inspection, and which is self-explanatory. The next is called shifting dullness, which requires the skill of percussion, which as discussed more in the lung exam videos, consists of a firm tapping of the body with attention paid to the sound that's generated. Percussing over an air-filled structure such as the bowel generates a resonant sound, while percussing over the fluid generates a sound that's dull. In a patient with ascites, the bowels literally float on top within the peritoneal space, such that percussing close to the umbilicus generates a resonant sound, and as one gradually moves laterally and downward relative to the floor, one reaches a horizontally oriented border, at which point the resonance turns to dullness. Make mental note of the location of this border. Then ask the patient to roll to their side and you repeat the percussion to see if that transition point has moved, suggesting that free fluid has redistributed under the influence of gravity. Olga does not have any abdominal distension, which means we would not typically attempt this maneuver on her in real life. So this is a little bit of an artificial demonstration, but this is what it would look like. The last ascites maneuver is called the fluid wave, and it requires a second examiner. One examiner places their two hands against the midline of the anterior abdominal wall, while the other places their hands on either side of the distended abdomen. While the first examiner's hands stay still, the second rapidly pushes against one side of the abdomen and observes for a wave of fluid to be felt by the other hand. The point of the first examiner is to prevent movement of the abdominal wall itself from confusing what's felt by the second examiner. Occasionally, if a second examiner is not available, the first examiner might ask the patient themselves to place their own hands against their own abdomen, but that seems kind of awkward to me. Regarding the evidence for these three findings, bulging flanks and shifting dullness have mildly helpful positive and negative likelihood ratios for detecting ascites, while the positive likelihood ratio from detecting a fluid wave is moderately helpful. The assessment of possible ascites is one of the specific situations in which point-of-care ultrasound, if it's available, far exceeds the diagnostic capabilities of the physical exam. Next is the assessment of the liver. 
I have categorized the commonly taught liver percussion as an archaic maneuver and discussed and demonstrated in the relevant video, but there is better evidence to continue supporting the palpation and assessment of the liver edge specifically in suspected cirrhosis and surprisingly to some suspected tricuspid regurgitation. To find the liver edge, you can use a similar technique to how we looked for splenomegaly. Start lower than you think you need to in the right lower quadrant. Press down with your hand and while holding it still, ask the patient to take in a deep breath. See if you can feel the inferior liver edge bump into or slip under your hand as the diaphragm pushes it downward. If not, ask the patient to breathe out as you move your hands several centimeters higher towards the right upper quadrant and repeat. If you manage to feel the liver edge before you reach the costal margin, you will want to note if it's tender, which suggests acute hepatitis, if it's firm and nodular, which suggests cirrhosis, or if it's pulsatile, which suggests moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation. Despite the occasional assumption to the contrary, the ability to feel the liver edge does not necessarily mean that the patient has liver enlargement known as hepatomegaly. True hepatomegaly is best identified on either ultrasound or CT, but a palpable liver edge does increase its likelihood. Evidence supporting the assessment of a palpable liver edge is modestly helpful at both rolling in and rolling out the presence of cirrhosis, and moderately helpful at rolling in tricuspid regurgitation, but not at all helpful with ruling it out. Next, I'll be talking about the assessment of several intra-abdominal infections, the first of which is peritonitis, which is inflammation of the peritoneum, which is the lining of the peritoneal cavity. With the exception of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, or SBP, seen predominantly as a complication of cirrhosis, peritonitis is otherwise a complication of another infection, bowel perforation, or penetrating trauma, rather than a primary condition of its own. In the core exam, I already talked about some of the findings of peritonitis, involuntary guarding and rigidity of the abdominal wall muscles. In addition, there is a frequently discussed finding called rebound tenderness. To elicit this finding, press down on the abdomen very slowly in the location at which the patient is reporting pain, and then abruptly let go. Rebound tenderness, or just rebound for short, is considered to be present if the pain is worse with the abrupt release of pressure than it was with the initial slow application of pressure. A few things about this maneuver. It only makes sense to test it in patients who have abdominal tenderness. But also, some clinicians feel that it doesn't provide additional information beyond what's already apparent from the rest of the exam, and thus is causing brief but unnecessary additional discomfort. Two less commonly discussed maneuvers that evaluate the same phenomenon are eliciting percussion tenderness, which abdominal pain is transiently worsened by conventional abdominal percussion, and the cough test in which the patients experience transient worsening of, of abdominal pain in response to coughing on request. Regarding the evidence for these findings, we see that they are all roughly similar in their test characteristics. In addition, I've included abnormal bowel sounds in the chart to show that despite common teaching to the contrary, abdominal auscultation is really not helpful with diagnosing peritonitis. I do want to make one additional point here about detecting peritonitis. These discussed maneuvers are not useful in the previously mentioned condition, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Patients with SBP typically present with fever and confusion and usually do not have rigidity, rebound, or even plain old abdominal tenderness. Next, let's discuss two eponymous signs related to the gallbladder. Murphy's sign is elicited in patients reporting right upper quadrant pain or tenderness by placing pressure under the right costal margin where the gallbladder typically lies and asking the patient to take in a deep breath while your hand remains still. With inspiration, the diaphragm descends, pushing the liver down, which then pushes the gallbladder down and into where your hand is applying the pressure. Murphy's sign is present when the pain is transiently worsened with this maneuver and is considered a sign of cholecystitis, 
or inflammation of the gallbladder, typically from infection. Another technique for left-handed individuals is to uh, palpate the liver with just your thumb, or alternatively is to stand a little bit higher on the patient and to wrap your hands around the, the root cage. This is sometimes referred to as the hooking technique or the hook technique. The presence of Murphy's sign slightly improves the diagnostic information obtained from conventional right upper quadrant tenderness. Occasionally, clinicians will discuss a rarer finding called Corvassier's sign. This is the presence of a palpable gallbladder in a patient with jaundice, which the evidence shows is very strongly suggestive of extrahepatic biliary obstruction. However, it's hard to imagine a patient in our current era presenting with new onset jaundice due to elevated conjugated bilirubin who would not automatically get abdominal imaging irrespective of the abdominal exam findings. So I don't think this particular sign is as useful today. There are four findings within the abdominal exam classically associated with appendicitis. While all of these have some degree of evidence behind them, that evidence is relatively modest and contemporary medical practice includes the near ubiquitous use of abdominal imaging for patients presenting with acute abdominal pain. Therefore, while a general surgeon might disagree with this approach, I only teach assessment for tenderness at McBurney's point as the only physical exam finding to check here. McBurney's point is located one third of the distance between the right anterior superior iliac spine and the umbilicus, which is above the most common location of the base of the appendix. Interestingly, the 19th century surgeon, Charles McBurney, for whom the point is named, did not actually describe its location in precisely the same way. It's been my observation that the most underutilized physical exam maneuver in the abdomen may be the abdominal wall tenderness test, sometimes known by the eponym Carnet test or Carnet sign. The point of this maneuver is to differentiate abdominal tenderness due to an intraperitoneal etiology from an etiology that's either within the abdominal wall or one that's psychogenic in origin. To perform this maneuver, the examiner locates the point of maximal tenderness by gentle palpation. For this demonstration, we will assume it's here on our patient. Then the examiner should apply enough pressure to elicit moderate pain and while still pressing down, ask the patient to lift their head and upper chest off the bed as if doing a crunch or partial sit-up. The abdominal wall tenderness test is considered to be positive when this maneuver results in an increase in pain, which is suggestive of pathology of the wall itself or a psychogenic cause. This is because with intraperitoneal pathology, including peritonitis, this maneuver would be expected to decrease the pain because tensing of the abdominal wall muscles protects the organs from the externally applied pressure. Abdominal wall tenderness can be from diabetic neuropathy, hernias, or an under-recognized condition called anterior cutaneous nerve entrapment syndrome. Regarding the evidence supporting the use of the, the abdominal wall tenderness test, there are several studies that provide information about this. Among patients with chronic abdominal pain, a positive test reduces the likelihood of the visceral cause of the pain and a negative test increases its likelihood. The last maneuver I'll be talking about in this video is abdominal auscultation, but I'm not talking about auscultation of bowel sounds. As already mentioned, auscultation is not helpful for assessing peritonitis, and although there is modest evidence for its use in assessing for a small bowel obstruction, all patients presenting with a possible SBO are going to get some form of imaging, and I don't believe that auscultation adds anything to that. Instead, I'm talking about the auscultation for abdominal bruits. A bruit is a whooshing sound created by turbulent blood flow within the blood vessel, most classically in a medium to large sized artery that has a focal pathologic narrowing due to atherosclerosis, vasculitis, or something called fibromuscular dysplasia. Importantly, not all abdominal bruits are pathologic. Clues that a bruit is indeed pathologic are that it is present in both systole and diastole, and that it's loudest off the midline. While it's common to hear clinicians discuss bruits as a sign of an aortic aneurysm, it has not been shown to be diagnostically helpful for that particular condition. However, the presence of a bruit is helpful 
for diagnosing something called renovascular hypertension, which is a form of secondary hypertension caused by stenosis of one or both renal arteries, which tricks the downstream kidney into thinking the individual is dehydrated, resulting in an inappropriate increase in activity within the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone axis. The appropriate place to listen for this particular brewery is in the epigastrum on both sides of the midline. Among patients referred to a specialist for evaluation of severe hypertension, the presence of a combined systolic diastolic brewery had a positive likelihood ratio of nearly 40 for renovascular hypertension, making this finding pathognomonic. That concludes this video on specialized maneuvers within the abdominal exam. I'd like to thank Olga for helping me out today. Be sure to check out the rest of this ongoing series.